Welcome to Rebel Chaser. My name is Gail, and this clip comes from Judge Patricia Fassett at the Cowlitz County Superior Court in Washington. This is a child custody hearing, and this hearing came about immediately after the GAL turned in her report that basically said the father should have the child and the mother should have visitation and then this happens so in my opinion when the mother found out that the child was going to be going to the father that this is her doing in my opinion you guys might have a different opinion let me know what you guys think I'm going to kind of stay out of it, but in my opinion, this is definitely parental alienation. This happened to a friend of mine, and he was just heartbroken. He loved his kids. And so when stuff like this happens, I, can, I, I usually can spot it, but so does the judge. She's amazing. I'm going to stay out of it for, from here on out. I'll let you guys decide. Preveling and Hagen, 12300706-8. That is ready, Judge. All right. Ready, Your Honor. I'm assuming all the parties received the GAL report. Sorry, my computer's running extremely slow. So that was filed on the 13th of October. October? Correct. We did receive that. Uh, my client has reviewed that as well, and we're ready to proceed today. As are we, Your Honor. Um, I do believe uh, we did receive email contact from the jail. There may be some additional information. I defer to her to find any additional information in the court. Um, and then I think the parties are, are prepared to proceed. Ms. Height, is there any, uh, assuming you've shared it with both counsel, is there something in supplemental to your report from the 13th that you'd like to relay? Yes, there is, Your Honor. I, I did notify both of them of my visits with Mason subsequent to the time this report was filed. Um, I'm going to look at my notes, if that's okay with Your Honor. Um, I, would, I would note that in my report, uh, every time I spoke with Mason, he was very clear from the very first statement he made to me to the several conversations i would say we probably had um i was going to look that up and give you an exact number maybe three or four phone calls and we've had a couple of in-person visits and he always was very positive about what he wanted that he wanted to to go to dad's and i delineated much of that in my report so i was quite surprised when on uh the 18th on um, september or rather october 18th a little after two o'clock i received a message, I need to talk to you, uh, a text message from him. And when I called him back, he was crying. He was quite emotional. It took him a while to gather himself. And he said, I want to change it. I don't want to go to dad's. I can't leave my friends. I'm, I'm reading now from the notes that I took specifically. I can't be my, I can't fully be myself. I can't fully be myself. Um, mom has been trying. Uh, and our conversation was rather sketchy because he he would break down and cry and need some time to um, gather himself. Uh, he said, I love both of my parents. Uh, we talked just a little bit more generically and he began to calm down. Um, so I told him that I was going to make sure the court heard what he had to say. I texted with him on the night, the next day on the 19th because I was still concerned about how emotional he had been. Just a quick text I, during his school hours, how was your day going? And he said it was going okay. Monday, I visited with Mason at the school and he was emotionally in really good shape. He was able to clearly uh, talk to me about uh, how things were going at school, things were good. And then with a kind of a grin, he said, I lied to my soccer coach and pulled up his pants and showed me multiple soccer bruises on his legs and said that I lied to my coach. I told him I didn't want to go to, I couldn't go to soccer because I was hurt, but I just didn't want to go. All of that was preliminary to getting into what 
he really needed to talk with me about. And what what my notes tell me he said was, it's a hard time and it will just be harder. I don't want to leave my friends. When I told them I would be leaving, I might be leaving school on Tuesday, they said they don't want me to leave and I'm the one who makes school good for them. Um, he said, I don't want to try it. I can be better. I can get better by myself. He then said, um, school is more relaxed at mom's. School things are more relaxed at mom's. If I mess up at school at dad's, I would get blamed for it. Um, then he talked quite a bit more about his friends and things he wanted to do about his friends. Uh, when I asked him about how he uh, happened to be telling his friends that he would be uh, leaving, possibly leaving school on Tuesday, which is today, he couldn't or wouldn't explain that to me. And I didn't press him. He just said, is that going to happen? And I told him, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't make the decisions, but that I would be very sure that your honor heard precisely what uh, what he had told me today. And that I assured him that both of his parents love him and we left on very good terms. Uh, that was yesterday about this time of day. I haven't talked to him since then. So besides my report, that's the supplemental information that I have for your honor today. Thank you, it's pretty significant. Does either council have any questions um, of Ms. Height? No, I, I don't think so, Judge. I think she did a, as for Ms. Height's usual self, did a pretty thorough job on that, did get that information. My client was aware of that. Uh, he reached out to me uh, initially once we received that. We've had communication between Mr. Baldwin and myself, Ms. Height and myself, and obviously my client and myself regarding that. I do have comment on that. I think it's uh, pretty transparent as to what has occurred, but I'll save that for my arguments. Mr. Baldwin. I don't have any questions for Ms. Height. All right. Thank you, Ms. Height. I appreciate it. All right. Um, we'll start, Ms. Mr. Baldwin, since your client's a petitioner, I don't um, have a motion okay. before me, so. I, yeah, I believe we were here initially because Mr. Zandi um, made a motion for out of a cause I think there's definitely a, a dispute as to what the predicate factor is here. I anticipate Mr. Zandi's viewpoint is is going to be that my client had a hand in putting the child up to making a change. Um, as evidenced in the GEO report that was written, my client's maintained throughout the proceeding that it's her opinion that father has um, been in some ways insinuating himself and, and his desire for a change onto the child as evidenced by what up until very recently was a relationship with my client that was fairly fraught with animosity as, as identified in the jail report. Um, to say, as Ms. Height did, that he was consistent initially in his desire to move or relocate, um, I think it might even be an understatement as to how significant or severe behavioral issues were at times in my client's care after visitation with father. Um, there, seems to be, at least in some regards, the consideration of concerns for ongoing issues for this child um, while in mom's care. And I, I don't doubt at all the integrity and veracity of, of those concerns. It seems that to the JAL, both parents recognized that coming into this, there were circumstances that suggested Mason was in crisis. Um, Ms. Height recognizes in, in her report that at least in some regards, um, given the age of the child, his his will is not necessarily the most controlling or the only factor the court considers, but that was adamant and clear in the jail recommendation that he did not want to continue residing at my clients um, with a significant amount of the accusations that give rise to the recommendation of, of changing placement coming from Mason himself. And that's a complete 180 here um, with what he is indicating to the guardian ad litem. Um, he, he came home from a visit with dad. And again, it, we're in a situation where um, neither party, because there was this ongoing uncertainty, filed any declarations or additional information. Um, as I said, I anticipate Mr. Zandi's argument in some way would be that my client is the one who um, instilled in Mason that 
uh, he's likely to be moving as a means of some sort of emotional manipulation. Um, and we would we would dispute that vehemently. Um, there were issues as recently as last week with uh, Mason not wanting to participate in school or counseling services because it, none of it mattered. He was moving in with his dad. And my client has maintained throughout his clear in the jail report that that came from dad. Um, it is unfortunate that it is a very recent change where we don't have more time or record for the court on whether or not Mason has turned a corner with his behavior at school. Um, the GAL report, and I believe conversation with GAL school was not a primary consideration or concern necessarily in the location because he wasn't doing particularly well in school, was having behavioral issues in school. And that seems to be a significant factor in his decision making here and wanting to stay where he lives. Um, some of the statements to the guardian item certainly are concerning um, that it's just going to be harder if he's at his dad's. If he does anything wrong at dad's house, he's going to be blamed for it. Is is a telling and, and concerning statement from a child about um, what would be ongoing at at father's house. I think the underlying issue here is clear, um, both in the report and in the statement by Miss Height that that this child does have two parents that care very deeply. Um, and our position is that the report taken in concert with the current wishes of Mason and um, I think a fairly significant turnaround and change in his behavior in the last week or so in mom's home, that a change in, in placement is not necessary. And we, we'd ask the court not to make a change. If the court's going to make a change, I think that um, the parties live in Rainier and, and Woodland. Um, 50-50 would be very difficult, and jail does indicate that uh, there are issues in the party's ability to co-parent that might make that not the best outcome or decision, that whichever parent is the non-custodial parent should have more than standard visitation, um, that the cooling off period that was originally proposed would no longer be necessary, and that visitation should be uh, more regular than just an alternating weekend for whoever the non-custodial parent is. So I guess just to <laughs> summarize, there was a adequate cause motion that was ultimately granted. Is your position, is your client's position that essentially the parenting plan that was in effect should just remain in effect? Yes, Your Honor. At this point, I think what the adequate cause was was agreed and it was set over for the court to consider whether or not a temporary parenting plan was needed. Uh, our position would be no change is needed at this time and if the court is going to make a change that it, it should result in significant time for the non-custodial parent if it is changed to the father um, more than a standard plan, that a lot of those concerns in the jail report don't appear to be active or ongoing uh, based on the new information, um, but that we don't believe there needs to be a change, at least on a temporary basis, that doesn't prevent the matter from moving forward without a cause having been found. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Mr. Dandy. Thank you, Your Honor. Courts where I do represent the original respondent, the moving party to the petition for you know, to change the parenting plan, namely uh, Garrett Haugen. And it's our position that we've got the obvious signs of a 12 year old who is in crisis. It's our position that we're at a very significant crossroads in this young man's life. I think that is parlayed by the findings of the GAO. I think that is evidenced by the information we have provided you, which is very significant for Mason's school. Uh, it's evidenced by the information that my client details for you, and, and uh, I'll go ahead and say it, we were somewhat surprised by some of the findings in the GAL because that surpassed a lot of the issues that we even knew were prevalent. The court went back to the onset of this filing, and again, I think the history is somewhat uh, important in this. This is just not about what a 12-year-old wants to do or does not want to do. That is one of several factors that the court considers, but if you look at the information, if you look at the information that's dated back to the spring, this is from the teachers. This is from the same uh, school that referred and, and called CPS due to concerns about Mason uh, and his care for his mom. These are the same people who report. It's in the email that we provided to you at the onset of this case back in August uh, that stated in very unambiguous you know, terms that Mason wants to live with dad. Mason is more comfortable at dad's home. Uh, Mason has expressed a safety net at dad's home that he just quite simply does not have at mom's. He tells the GAL that not once, not twice, but multiple times over the course of the investigation. What happens on October 18th? 
last week, and, and, and again, on a day or two after the GAO report was published, we get then grumblings that my client is contacted uh, by the child, his wife, or excuse me, fiance, uh, is contacted by the child and says, I don't want to live with you guys. I changed my mind. The child is in tears. He is emotional. My client hears things in the background, which could have been a television set, could have been his mother. We don't know. Uh, that's guesswork at this point. But what we know is a child who has been adamant about living with dad, adamant that dad's house is where he wants to be, all of a sudden, within moments of the GAO report being published, says, no, in uh, close to hysterical terms, I want to live with mom. Can't really express the reason for that, but I just think it would be better. We look at the GAL's findings and we go back to some of the uh, investigative work of Ms. Height and we see that there is some undertones that are pretty clear that mom is exposing the child to the litigation. Mom is showing pleadings. Mom is showing proposed parenting plans. Mom is emotionally sabotaging this child, manipulating him to the point of what we could call only as alienation type tactics. The same type of thing that we absolutely uh, despise uh, when, when we're practicing this type of law and looking at these types of facts. Mom was doing that throughout the course of this case. This is a case which, th these aren't new issues. These are issues that are going back several years that we initially had back at the onset of COVID, uh, prior to argument, prior to all of that. The history of this is, is something that continues to fester, continues to boil, uh, but this is something that has gotten worse over the past three years. This child, again, is in crisis with that. If we look at what was provided to you and in, in the initial allegations of my client leading up to this point, he states for you, and, it, and it's ironic when you get mom's response to this, he tells you about the conditions of the home. We give you the information from the schools. We give you the information about the CPS investigations. We give you the information uh, through documentation. And we gave you just a snapshot of that, which Rainier schools finally reach out to my client after he has conveniently left off the contact list for mom and say your kid has some major issues and recommends a change. The school goes so far as to say, please, this needs to be presented to the court. We are presenting this to CPS based on what Mason is coming back and reporting. Mom, by the GAL's account, has at least 10 boyfriends. The GAL in her report cites that she had to actually kind of make a flow chart of those boyfriends. Some of those boyfriends are beating Mason with a belt. Others are uh, having extreme interactions with uh, Miss Kremlin. Others are sleeping in the same bed and having uh, sexual relations while Mason is in the room with them. This is not a conducive environment for a 12 year old. 12 year old then goes through mom's phone and sees the pictures of mom sexting with one of these boyfriends and nude pictures of his mother. Think about the trauma to that of a preteen boy who's on the verge of puberty. Mason then goes to school and has the, the girlfriend in which he's sending lewd pictures to based on what he sees on mom's phone. Mom, in some kind of an emotional response back in June, uh, leaves the kids at home, um, goes out to the middle of the woods in the bushes and the, in the railroad tracks, and essentially goes off the grid for a period of time because she's on the verge of breakdown. Mom repeatedly moves in violation of the relocation statute. Mom unilaterally decides what the parenting plan is going to be, despite what's on paper. My client details for you, and there's very little response uh, for Ms. Krebley, that it's his weekend with Mason, and basically he's on alert for whenever, although the plan says 5 o'clock, it might be 7 o'clock, it might be 7.30, it might be later, because mom does what mom wants to do. Mom leaves him off the contacts from all of the doctor's information. My client had no idea that the child was even on ADHD medication until after the fact. The school had no idea that my client even existed until he said, listen, I, I'm concerned about my child. He wasn't even on the contact list at the child's school. The same school where there's an IEP and a 504 plan in effect. Mom then says, well, I don't like what the school's doing. I'm going to uproot this kid again, and we're going to go live in Longview. She doesn't provide relocation notice. I'm going to take the kid and go to Three Rivers Christian. Again, without notice, without input from my client, she unilaterally dictates to him what's going to happen. Now, the latest and kind of the last thought to this is we're going to latch on to Mason. We're going to emotionally manipulate him. Again, a 12-year-old child who wants structure, who wants love, who wants support from both parents. I think that's obvious. And she said and, and it influences him, again, to give the input. One can only assume because this is the same parent who's been showing him pleadings throughout this matter. And this is the same child who has way too much information uh, about this litigation which the GAO uh, surmises comes directly from mom. We then have these games that mom decides to play and the GAO refers to that as a prank. I don't know what it is. 
uh, in which mom is going around town, or we suspect mom, it certainly looks like that through the investigation. I'll let Ms. Hyde comment on that. Plants keys around town that says, if found, please contact my client, puts his personal information, including his phone number and his address on there and plants those throughout town. So he's getting vague, bizarre phone calls from people who has no idea what they're talking about saying they found his keys. From what we understand that's some kind of a scam, I have no idea. And what does mom do? Just kind of shrugs her shoulders. We get the information from Mason. Mom doesn't deny it, but she also doesn't admit to it. She says, oh, it could have been somebody else. It could have been Garrett doing that to himself just to look better in court, which seems highly bizarre and highly unlikely. So we have all of these things. All of these have an impact on the child who tells you what, that to the GAO. I found a bag of keys on my bed that I no longer use anymore because I sleep in a couch in a very crowded, very small home. That's filthy, by the way. And those keys all have my dad's information on. So we can draw certain conclusions from this. You know, part of this issue is looking at who's being candid and forthright. And I think that's clear that mom just doesn't have any ability to do that. Mom has not done that. And mom continues to kind of spin this uh, woes me web of trying to gain sympathies for that, but for her actions in which she has just not performed as a parent. Would also mention, and I think it's, it's abundantly clear, when I say this child is in crisis, when I say we're at some kind of a fork in the road, changing schools now is very important to do that. And again, if we look at the respective households of the parties, that gives further evidence and credence to that conclusion. My client lives with his fiance. He lives in a spacious home in Woodland. He has no plans to move. He is stable by all accounts. He's financially stable, emotionally stable, and relational uh, stable uh, in his ability to provide for this child who says initially, and said throughout until the last couple of days, dad's house is great. I get along with my stepbrother and my uh, stepsister. I get along with my soon-to-be stepmom. And we do fun things at dad's house. Mind you, mom's suggesting that the child now again uproot and move to Longview and move to Three Rivers. Uprooting this child in the midst of the school year, although we, we typically don't like to see that, makes no point and makes no difference at this point. Child is not doing well in school, hasn't done well in school. We've given you information from Rainier that shows he's at a third grade reading level and he's now a seventh grader. To suggest these friends, and, and again, which kind of comes out of the blue, want him to stay. I'm sure there's some reluctance to, to that. All 12 year olds are going to be a little bit leery of going to a new school, going into a new environment. But the fact remains the bar is so low for this child right now because he hasn't performed uh, academically. He hasn't performed socially. And the friends that he has have not been good influences. These are the same friends who have kind of festered and manifested this issue with, again, the lewd pictures that Mason sent. This is the only option at this point. And again, I'm somewhat concerned when mom comes forward and says, well, dad's doing these things. In her proposed parenting plan, she lists my client as having 191 factors. She alleges alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, alienation tactics. But if you look at just the, the, the black and white of this picture and what comes from the school, what comes from the GAL, and what comes from factually based non minus third parties, it shows mom is doing that. Mom is the one that doesn't return the child. Mom is the one who doesn't give my client his summer visits in 2022. Mom is the one who is showing this child uh, all this information uh, related to the court action, which again is despicable. Mom is the one who doesn't include dad on the medical uh, decision-making, doesn't include him with the schools, doesn't give him notice or uh, of anything. Those are alienation tactics. That's withholding. Those are contempt measures. We don't want that. We just simply want what's best for this 12-year-old kid because again, we are at a very significant crossroads in Mason's life. And the only suitable environment for him at this point uh, is my client's. I think it's very clear to see what's going on. I think it is extremely sad. I think we are fortunate that we have a place where Mason can go, where he can hopefully thrive. He can't do any worse than he's doing currently at Rainier. And again, that's evidenced by the teachers. I cannot recall a single case in which I can have a, a school or a teacher reach out to the amount of time because they're so concerned about this child as Rainier has over the past year and a half. They reached out to the CPS, they reached out to mom, they reached out to dad, they've even given the child special access to phones so that he can communicate with parents on a need as need basis and come forth with some pretty damning information that shows mom is simply failing as a parent. That needs to change. And again, this isn't about what my client wants, this isn't what about what mom wants, this isn't about what I want or Mr. Baldwin wants, this is about what's best for the child. And at this point, the move is not only justified, it's the only option.
So that's where we stand. We are asking uh, that you approve the original relief that we uh, requested back in the summer. We're asking you to adopt the GAL's report. I think that makes sense. By no means are we trying to cut off contact between Mason and his mother, but the reality is her home is not suitable for primary custody. It's, it's just not. You got a 12 year old sleeping on a couch looking at naked pictures of his mother on her phone. And again, that's completely inappropriate. Uh, so given that information, given the jail report, I put very little stock in what happened over the last couple of days, other than it's further evidence that shows one of these parties, and I think it's clear to see which one, is influencing this child or attempting to by manipulating his 12-year-old brain into thinking that it's his decision, that the pressure is on him, the onus is on him, and it's not. This child is not a caretaker for his mother. This child should be deserved to be allowed to be a child, and he's 12 years old. We're asking you adopt the change. We're asking for the relief cited. And we're also asking for a mutual restriction. And my client would certainly agrees to this, that nobody involves this kid in this action. There's no review of pleadings. There is no negative talk about the other parent. They both love this child. They just have very different ways of parenting. That's great. That's a start. But they need to quit involving this kid in adult matters and making him think it's his choice putting him in the position of having the emotional distress that he's had over the past week since the GAL report has been published. I think that point needs to be clear to uh, everybody involved. And I think this child is in desperate need of change. And I've got real concern when the GAL report uh, cites eating issues, when the GAL report cites concern about this child potentially harming himself or others. That begs that whatever the current arrangement is, is not working. That's our request. I think it makes sense given the information in front of you and we're asking you to adopt our form of relief. Thank you, Mr. Zandi. Anything else? I have a response, Your Honor. I don't know. Uh, Ms. Hype was unmuted. I don't know if she had anything to say before I did, but. Go ahead, Mr. Baldwin. Um, as with respect to the argument relating to the prior pleadings, that we did agree that there was a basis for the court to consider adequate cause. It was likely given the accusations and the concern from the school that the court would make a finding of adequate cause. We don't agree with a multitude of the assertions or accusations um, in the father's pleadings or in the argument. Um, with respect to school issues, his report card um, that was submitted as an exhibit showed that he was at or approaching grade level. Um, his standardized test scores showed below grade level. That was the basis for that concern. Um, unfortunately, I think it's it's been relatively common, especially since this time for kids during COVID, uh, where standardized test scores have been below grade level, but the teacher's actual report card was showing, um, at least in what was able to be submitted by either party, um, in English specifically, a three on the scale of one to four, where three is meeting standards, grasping the, the level of the grade. Um, so I think the adherence to the standardized test score alone um, is not an adequate representation of where he is academically. He certainly has issues. I think it's it's interesting that the significant uh, majority of the accusations against my client come from Mason and and a situation where when he wants to go live at dad's, he says my client's the worst, and when he doesn't, he says things are fine, and and he's. The reporter for, for a good portion of this, unfortunately. Um, as far as the school, um, the school is completely out of line in, in the situation they, they put themselves in here. Um, my client maintained her declaration initially uh, as part of the adequate cause that she had regular contact with the father to address concerns with the school, and she was the face to the school complaining about their conduct and behavior, but that it was mutual. Uh, and Exhibit B uh, to her declaration um, back in August, she included uh, portions of emails that the school had with both parents identifying concerns and regular reports and behavior. Um, so I don't think it's it's accurate or appropriate um, or reflected by any of the evidence that my client excluded him. She was the face of the problem with the school. Um, the two of them were in communication. That's what our assertion is in her declaration. And, and, and he was apprised by the school of issues. Um, he indicated at the time he wanted to live with dad. Now he says he doesn't. Unfortunately, it was clear at the time in the, the filings of both parents that Mason had engaged in animosity towards my client. It is a very glib uh, presentation to suggest that his life with mom is sleeping on the couch and looking at naked pictures of her. Uh, that's not accurate. It's not 
reflective of any of the evidence. My client's um, declaration uh, regarding that situation, it, he used her phone. He was able to um, unlock her phone with face ID and looking through her photos, saw a photo. Um, it's a something that, that is very significantly glossed over in the connection from that to sending a naked picture to someone that, that occurred under father's care and custody. Um, and my client's opinion is identified in her declaration. Is that something that he effectively tried to sort of sweep under the rug and not acknowledge the concern related to? Um, none of that, unfortunately, I, I think is really what's controlling. A lot of time spent talking about, about those past declarations and, and accusations my client refuted and denies that she was engaged in um, any sort of alienation on father. She makes very clear her declaration as do the declarations of the family members with whom she resides that when Mason would come back from business with his dad, he was very difficult to the point of insubordinate and disrespectful, uh, bordering on misogynist in the way he treated his mother and other women in the household, and they attributed that to father. Um, all that notwithstanding, the GAL's recommendation report was based on observations of the child in crisis, and now all of a sudden he doesn't seem or isn't acting or behaving in any way, shape, or form like he is. I can't say that he isn't. Um, I can't say that that he is fine. It, it is definitely concerning the uh, speed with which that switch was flipped and 180 is done, and and he um, no longer wants to to move or relocate. Um, Mr. Zandi's representation arguments is that's reflective of the fact that mom engaged in some form of manipulation. And my client is adamant that before um, um, she even had the jail report, Mason came home from visit with dad and was adamant he didn't have to listen to her anymore because he was going back home with dad. But that could have only come from dad's house. Whether that was seeing dad readying a room for him or something that was said, um, these things are happening outside of this child who's reacting emotionally to them. Um, this case doesn't end with whatever decision the court makes. The court found adequate cause. This is just a temporary order. Um, but given the more recent information, my position is that there should not be a change. And as I said, if the court is going to make any change, um, that more significant visitation be afforded to my client um, in the interim, whether that's Friday after school to Monday drop off, um, first third and fourth or or what it is that there should be regular contact for them because this is just a temporary order at this point and his current presentation to the GAL is very different than what he had been presenting in the build-up to this. Thank you. Ms. Hyde, did you want to um, add anything or clarify anything before I make my ruling? Just very briefly, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, What I see here is a combination of a little boy who <laughs> proudly pulls up his pants legs to show me his bruises as if he's about a six-year-old. And on the other hand, a burdened young man who says what I think is probably the most poignant statement, I can get better. I can get better by myself. And that is very troubling to me that that's his mindset. Um, I continue to be extremely concerned for his safety, for his mental health. And I stand, having clearly stated to the court his change of statements, um, I stand firmly on my original report, Your Honor. I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Height. Uh, I haven't given this speech in a while, so I'm going to just say it's extremely difficult for the court. The court's getting a snapshot of the lives of people that, you know, um, obviously there's several things happening, several moving parts, a lot of issues. I will take away that I think both parents do care very greatly for this child and want the best for this child. Um, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, not every child has that. And so I'm glad that, um, that we're in a situation where both parents do care for this for this young man. Uh, I am concerned. I read the, the report and actually read it more than once because there's some pretty significant um, and glaring issues, in my opinion, that stood out from this report. Uh, 
I obviously am aware of the adequate cause motion, the things that were agreed upon in that adequate cause motion, the concerns with uh, kind of some of the things that were happening at moms, the concerns with the behavior at school, and then the, you know, when exchanges were happening and, and those things. One of the things that I can state, uh, the only person that um, the child indicates shared, specifically shared information about this case with them uh, was mom. Is that accurate? Could that be the whole truth? No, not necessarily. Uh, but he readily admitted to uh, Miss Height that mom on at least two occasions, if not more, shared specific information about this case with him. Completely inappropriate. Uh, should not happen, should never happen, and neither party should be doing that. I think a mutual restriction uh, is appropriate and that there should be no involvement of this child in this proceeding. Clearly, uh, multiple interactions with this between this child and Ms. Height, there was one, uh, one request and one repeated request and one adamantly uh, given request throughout this. And uh, the fact that I do find it interesting that immediately following the uh, filing of this report, there's a change. Am I blaming anyone specifically for that? No, but I do find it um, somewhat compelling. The thing that most uh, really took uh, took me aback was the uh, some of the comments by Ms. Height about the, uh, and this is just a direct quote, quote uh, I believe the delay of relief for this child could result in unintended and perhaps self-imposed consequences. Uh, that this is a uh, cry out for relief and um, it's, it is concerning. And I think Ms. Height took a very kind of staunch stance in this case because of her concern for this uh, young child. Um, frankly, I, I, the fact that he was aware that there could be a change is concerning to the court, but uh, the easiest thing is to keep doing what you've always been doing. And, and especially a child's going to think that. Um, and in a moment of um, panic, reflection, knowledge of what's coming down the road, uh, I can see a child saying, nope, I want to just do the easier thing uh, because I don't want to disappoint this person or I don't want to disappoint that person or I want my friends um, and need my friends because they maybe have been uh, maybe not the best influences based on some of the, the school reports, but they may have been consistent for him. And I can understand that. Uh, I don't often read reports from a guardian ad litem that touch on such an, a, an emotional and um, kind of desperate need for something to change for a child. And uh, I have reviewed everything in this case. I've heard all the arguments today. Uh, again, uh, I'm getting a snapshot of the lives of these families and it's difficult to make these decisions. Uh, Ms. Height spent a lot more time with these people uh, investigating this report, speaking with the parties and the child in question, and I, I absolutely believe that it's appropriate to adopt her recommendations in this case. Do I think it's going to be easy for the parties? Absolutely not. Um, do I think it's going to be easy for this young man? Absolutely not. Uh, I want to stress that both parents need to work together for this child because he is in need of both parents. Uh, so there needs to be uh, cooperation moving forward. I don't know, Mr. Zandi, uh, where the child is currently. Is he with? He's mom? with the mom until I believe this weekend. My suggestion would be okay. maybe hold off on any changes until the weekend, but I'm a little bit reluctant on that given the amount of influence and communication he's had with mom about these proceedings. I don't want that to be a further trauma to him. So I guess uh, 
I'd be interested on what the GAL and the court think is best for that. But again, I, making the transition as smooth as possible is kind of paramount. I, I don't, I think Tuesday was probably in his head as being, a you know, kind of the uh, hammer day or the doomsday, whatever you want to phrase it for him. Um, I think it probably would be appropriate for uh, the transition to happen as it would regularly happen. Uh, Ms. Height, unless you feel that it needs to be more immediate, my inclination would be to have uh, when it's time to go to dad's house on Friday, then that's when he goes to dad's house. I would agree, Your Honor. Okay. So that's- Is it this weekend, your weekend, Garrett? Just nod. Yes, it is. So this Friday? I am concerned for him for the next few days. I don't know. Is he? Um, yes, but I, I'm just concerned for him. I I, I completely understand that. And uh, I guess the court doesn't take lightly these types of decisions. Um, they're very difficult to make and uh, taking all the evidence and information that I've been given, I feel it's the most appropriate at this point in time. As Mr. Baldwin stated, it is a uh, temporary order and um, Obviously, if uh, other concerns arise and the court's more than willing to, to take those into consideration as we move forward. Um, but I do think the uh, the switch for the weekend is, is most appropriate. Mr. Baldwin, I don't know if there's a counselor available or if your client can just um, maybe notify the school that if there's any counseling that he needs or a school counselor that may be available for him if there's any issues that arise as we move forward um, through this week. And um, I, I understand, uh, I, I, I want him to understand that I um, heard all of his requests and and uh, unfortunately this is not um, his fault. It's not the fault of anybody, but this is the decision the court's making at this point. So, Your Honor, and I guess I, I would make sure to clarify, given what you just indicated that if he asked either parent that all they do is maybe refer him to the GAL. Another parent should be talking to him about um, your honor hearing and, and considering or, or anything of the sort. I, I don't want it to accidentally be a situation where um, my client is alleged to have done something wrong or improper for having expressed that to him. Um, with respect to the visitation, you said that you're following the recommendation. Um, so what is your honor setting for, for the visitation for my client after the transfer? The original recommendation included a cooling off period. I don't know if you're finding that's necessary at this point. Um, so I, I want to make sure it's it's clear you're following the recommendation exactly as stated or uh, what you're doing as far as the visitation for my client. Mr. Zandy, do you want to be do you want to weigh in on those two things? If uh, first, do you think it's appropriate to uh, just have the child speak with Ms. Height, and Ms. Height, is that okay with you if we did something along those lines? Yes, Your Honor. Would you expect me then to relay to Mason in the broadest of terms what's coming up for him, this change? Is that what you're anticipating? Well, it sounds like Mr. Baldwin's concerned. It, um, he doesn't want to put his client in a situation where she may be, um, if, we're, if, if I, I am imposing that mutual restriction, then that would kind of prohibit her from discussing uh, what's happening. Obviously, he needs to know that there is going to be right. a change. He's yeah. aware of that. Uh, I think he thought that that might be today. Yes, um, and so his, his question directly to me was, is that going to happen? Um, and I, my response, of course, as I told you, was, well, we don't know. Um, I'm willing to do that. Um, I'm willing to do that if that needs to be done. I think there's two people that he trusts at this point, and one of them is Ms. Height. It sounds like they have a good relationship with one another. Um, typically, I would be uncomfortable with the GAL breaking that news given the circumstances. I am not. The only other person I think that the child, and I'm not suggesting this person, but it just shows kind of the limited scope we have. The only other person that he's really comfortable with at this point was his teacher last year, Ms. Johnston. So Ms. Johnson is clear that's not a position uh, for her. I think that leaves Ms. Height. Or alternatively, both parents can get together and they can meet somewhere for dinner together and as a joint team, learn to cooperate with one another and tell the child in each other's presence. 
which again leaves the door open for some chaos, but it also leaves the door open for some healing as well. So I think those would be my suggestions. Um, and again, everybody realizing that there's bigger stakes here than just hurt feelings of themselves, that there's a 12 year old kid who needs what's best and hopefully act accordingly and, and put their own desires over, you know, kind of what's best for, for Mason. So I, I'm fine with Ms. Height. I'm fine with these parties want to tell the child together. Counseling was not good. There's not a lot of other resources that, you know, Mason is comfortable with. Um, so I, I think that's probably the best we can do given the circumstances. And as I say, just to clarify too, Your Honor, part of it was, Your Honor had indicated at least generically that that he should be aware that you heard what he had provided to Miss Height and what his, what his thoughts were. And I didn't want either parent to be in a situation where by expressing that they would um, be in violation of, of any restraint of discussing what happens in court, even beyond just um, the relocation is, is being ordered. So I just wanted sort of to clarify that was, I think, as much as anything, a primary concern as much as, as the rest. But if Miss Height's comfortable, um, I, I don't see any problem with with that. I haven't been able to talk to my client. I know it's going to be emotional. Um, and, and so given what are very strong emotions and feelings about the history with the father, I, I think that might be more chaotic than good, although in, in a perfect world, that, that would be the best scenario of the two of them to be together. I don't know that that's something that's practical under the current circumstances. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, uh, and I appreciate Ms. Height, you being willing to kind of take this on. It's a little bit above and beyond what normally uh, would be happening here, but I, um, I'm going to defer that to Ms. Height, unless um, the parties communicate by way of Mr. Zanny, Mr. Baldwin, or between themselves and, and agree to have a conversation with him, the two of them. I, I agree that would be ideal. I understand there's a lot of um, history and and that may not be feasible at this point, but I, uh, if they are, if that's something that they're willing to do, then I absolutely think that probably would be the best uh, course of action. Uh, I otherwise would defer to Ms. Height. So I don't know if the parties want to consider that and maybe by noon tomorrow, if there can just be a confirmation to the attorneys that they can relay then to Ms. Height that they're willing to do that or they're not willing to do that. So then there's not a, a tremendous delay in letting letting him know. Your Honor, my, my preference would be to go to the school tomorrow, maybe around noon if possible, and talk with him face to face and have the support. Mr. Fougere, the counselor would be there and um, I'd like to do that sooner rather than later so he doesn't speculate and get worried about, you know, going down some rabbit trails that don't need to be gone down. So if that could, if the parties could let me know if I should not go to the school tomorrow around noon, I would appreciate that. If I don't hear from them, I'll just plan to go if that's all right with your honor. That sounds fair. Is that fair, Mr. Baldwin, Mr. Zandy? Yes, Your Honor. All right. That's fine by me. Um, do you want to set a date for presentation or do you believe agreed orders can be submitted ex parte? Let's go ahead and set one just to track it. I think it's probably going to be stricken. Let's go uh, two or three weeks out and I'll I'll draft those orders. And I apologize. We got to cut in the weeds there, Your Honor. Did, did you, are you following the recommendation exactly as stated for my client's visitation? Because I don't recall hearing that. Yes. However, um, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do the two week delay because essentially that would be a three week delay before the next visitation. So uh, it'll change this weekend, and then she'll get the first, third, and fifth. So that would be she'd have her visitation uh, the third. Does that make sense? So we'll just start yes, the effective date of the parenting plan November. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. And then Mr. Baldwin does the seventh or the fourteenth. Does one of those work better than the other for presentation? Um, I don't believe there's any issues. I'm just double checking my calendar. I apologize. Uh, the seventh would be my preference. That's two weeks. Does that work, Mr. Zanny? That's fine. All right. So let's set presentation for Tuesday the seventh, one o'clock p.m. If those are agreed, we can strike that. Thank you, Judge. Okay. All right. Well. Thank, Thank you. you. Best of luck. I, I will email a brief report back to uh, both of the attorneys when I've made my visit with 
Mason. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Height. Thank you, Your Honor. I wish both parents had been on the screen so you could see reactions and stuff, but I think the mother was that the person at the very beginning that her name was Sky. I'm not positive because I didn't hear anyone say her name. Um, so I'm not really sure. She turned off her camera real quick, you know, right after the, the hearing started. So that may have been her. It may not have been her. I'm not really sure. But that is way, way too much pressure to put on a 12 year old. Yeah, his stomach is upset. Of course it is. He's stressing about his parents. He's got to choose. That's completely wrong. And especially if the mother is saying, you know, you need to tell him this because you're not going to be able to see me. And you know, remember your father does blah, 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 blah. And whatever, you know, I just think this is way too much pressure to put on a child. And I feel so bad for this little boy. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about this. It's sad all around, no matter what. It's just sad. But thank you all for, very much for watching. I'll see you next time.